Well, we're down to our very last chapter in the year of chemistry. I bet your brain feels full by now. But we're going to do a mini unit on acids and bases. So I'm going to ask that you have the PowerPoint notes or lecture outline scaffolding that your teachers provided for you handy. And take good notes because I'm going to assess whether or not you watch this podcast by greeting you with a little quiz as you enter class at the next period. So today we're going to discuss the definitions of what are acids and bases and how we can tell the difference between a conjugate acid and a base uh, and talk a little bit more about the types of acids. And that's it. Our second and last unit for this mini chapter on acids and bases will cover pH. So first of all, the general properties of acids are that they taste sour. Uh, lemon juice is a citric acid and of course that tastes pretty sour. Vinegar as well. They react with metals to produce hydrogen gas. You've done that a bunch this year in labs. They do turn litmus paper, if you have neutral litmus paper, um, you could say it's, it's kind of a reddish color. I think of red hot acid. Other types of indicator papers turn different colors, but we associate the hotter colors with acids. And if you could see inside an acid with Superman's vision, you would see more hydrogen ions, actually hydronium, swimming around than you would hydroxide ions. The properties of acids also include the ability to react with the carbonate ion uh, to form CO2 gas, water, and some other kind of compound. So here's an eggshell made of calcium carbonate getting dissolved by vinegar. It's kind of cool. And as we learned in our electrolyte demonstrations, acids are conductors of electricity. The general properties of bases is they taste bitter. Um, blah, that's all I can say. Remembering when I got my mouth washed out with soap back in the 50s when that wasn't qualified as child abuse. They don't taste good. Uh, they feel slippery. So if you reach for a bar of soap, it feels kind of slimy, slippery. That's a property of bases. Um, if you have neutral litmus, I remember B is the letter that starts the word base and the word blue, so litmus paper turns blue. And we associate on pH paper the cooler colors, greens and blues, with um, basic or alkaline solutions. And if you could see inside a solution that is basic, you would see more hydroxide ions than hydrogen ions. Now there's really a couple, like three, definitions of acids. We're going to introduce the older Arrhenius definition, and it's very simple. It's anything that contains a hydrogen ion and produces them in an aqueous solution. So, for example, HCl. Now, you know, of course, that if you have hydrogen in the formula, it doesn't necessarily make you an acid, but this was the Arrhenius definition. In reality, when hydrochloric acid dissolves in water, it's not really forming hydrogen ions, because if you think about it, a hydrogen ion is just a proton. It's got a positive one, so it doesn't have an electron anymore. The only other part there was a proton, so it doesn't really exist as a hydrogen by itself. It goes and finds some water to make that guy, H3O+, plus, the hydronium ion. There's a lovely picture of how it does that. So a lot of times we simplify it by just showing hydrogen ions, but they're really forming hydronium ions. Here's another picture of hydrochloric acid and water forming hydronium ions, leaving behind a chloride ion, by the way. So that's a definition of Arrhenius acid. An Arrhenius base is anything hydroxide, usually something metallic hydroxide, like sodium hydroxide or calcium hydroxide and you would find hydroxide ions in solution. So it doesn't show water over the arrow, but if you put potassium hydroxide in water, it will split up to produce potassium ions and hydroxide ions. And it's a negative ion. So here are some general definitions of what makes an Arrhenius acid and an Arrhenius base. But what we're going to do is leave that definition behind because historically it's interesting. Let's go to use the more modern model of what acids and bases are. And the definition according to the Bronsted-Lowry is that an acid is any substance that can donate a proton. Remember a hydrogen ion. So a lot of times they use the word proton and hydrogen ion interchangeably because they're the same thing. So they're a proton donor. And a base 
will be any substance that can accept a proton from another substance. It's a proton acceptor. In this diagram here, hydrochloric acid will give away its hydrogen ion. It'll jump onto NH3 ammonia to form ammonium. And the remaining chloride ion that came from the HCl will reattach if you dry that solution out. Not the greatest equation, but we'll show you another one here in just a moment. The key concept is that the acid will donate a proton, the base will be the one that accepts it. To determine, look at the left before picture and the right side of an equation in the after, and you'll be able to tell which one donated and which one accepted. So acidic reactions involve an exchange of a proton. Here's a better picture of what happens when you put water um, with ammonia. Ammonia is a gas that's quite soluble in water because, as you know, it can hydrogen bond. So I know this is a base. Let's see why. Because it starts as NH3 and ended as NH4. It accepted a hydrogen. But the water, interestingly enough, is the only place it could have gotten the hydrogen from, so it acts as an acid. Now they will become something that we call conjugate acids and bases on the right, but I'm going to come back to that in another slide. So the proton acceptor is the base. The proton donor is the acid. And you can, don't worry about writing these next two, it's not critical. Okay, now this is our better definition of an Arrhenius acid. It's a substance that donates, excuse me, a Bronsted-Lowry acid that donates hydrogen ions, and a Bronsted-Lowry base is a substance that accepts them. Some substances, like water, can be both acidic and basic at the same time. It can be amphoteric. Now, what does that mean? So, even though you could look inside pure water as a molecular substance, about every few billion molecules or so, you'd see a few hydroniums and a few hydroxides swim by your field of vision. That's why the arrow pointing to the right is very tiny. Only a few of these form microscopic, and so the reaction is basically staying towards the left-hand side of this equilibrium. But notice that this water, H2O, became H3O. What was it acting as? If it accepted a hydrogen, it must be acting as a base. And this water had to be the source of the hydrogen because it lost a hydrogen and now all that's left is a hydroxide. So water is an example of an amphoteric substance. It can both be an acceptor and a donator of hydrogen ions, also called protons. Now I think one of our uh, last concepts in this mini vodcast is what is a conjugate acid and a conjugate base and what's a conjugate acid base pair. Rather than dwell on the definition that you see here, Let's take a look at a diagram. It's very simple. In this diagram, we can clearly see that the hydrochloric acid donates a hydrogen to the water. So the water becomes hydronium because it accepted a hydrogen. So it starts out H2O, ends up H3O. And where it got its H from? The acid, hydrochloric. So we call the thing that the acid becomes a conjugate base and we call the thing that the base becomes a conjugate acid. So let's take a look at that. The conjugate acid of H2O is H3O. And the acid, original acid, hydrochloric, all that's left of it is a chloride ion, and that is the conjugate base. So it's really easy. Identify who donated and who received a proton first, so you can see which one is the acid and which is the base. And then the acid becomes a conjugate base. The base becomes a conjugate acid. Here's another picture of, I think, an equation we had seen once before, and I had said don't write it down. Here is NH3 becoming NH4. This is a base. This is its conjugate acid, ammonium. The water gave away a hydrogen ion, and all that was left behind was its conjugate base, hydroxide. So when you link what they started as and what they ended up as, that is what we call a conjugate acid-base pair. The last very easy concept to understand is how we can name acids. 
They can be monoprotic or diprotic or triprotic. Mono means one, so they just have one hydrogen. Yes, I can see that in acetic acid there's three hydrogens right here, but all of our acids so far that we've de defined start as hydrogen something. Sometimes it's easier to call that hydrogen acetate, and that's the hydrogen that the acetic acid would give away. But if you only have one, you're monoprotic, and as I just said, they only contain one acidic hydrogen ion. However, you've probably noticed that there are some that are diprotic, that means two hydrogens to donate, or even triprotic, this is citric acid or maybe even phosphoric acid is H3PO4. The general term for acids that have more than one hydrogen ion to donate is called polyprotic because the word poly means many. Well, I believe that concludes this simple vodcast on what are acids and bases. So to recap and to be ready for your quiz, make sure you know what the definition is of an Arrhenius acid and base and compare and contrast that to a Bronsted Lowry, the more modern version that we use. Also, make sure you know what the properties of acids and bases are. Water is amphiprotic, be able to define that term. Be able to look at a reaction and define who is the base and acid and to be able to find their conjugate base and conjugate acid pairs. And know the difference between monoprotic, diprotic, triprotic, and that the term polyprotic is a general term for having more than one hydrogen to donate. That's it. One more podcast. You're done with chemistry for the year. Take care.